Aloha everyone. Today is, oh my gosh, the date is hidden. It's from my view, but it's the 4th, I believe, April the 4th, 2016. When I start the recorder, it cuts off certain parts of the screen, whether I like it or not, so I can't see all of it. Um, today, let me get the camera set here. Today I thought first I would read to you from something I wrote in Translations of the Golden Rod in 1975. Apparently I reprinted it in a 1982 Temple Doors issue, or 80, 82 Source issue, and then reprinted it in 1996 issue? I don't know. I'm trying to follow the path, but I'm pretty sure this was written originally. I'm, you know, 99.9% .9 sure. This was written originally in 1975 as part of a little paperback book I did called, um, self-published, called Translations of the Golden Rod on science. And um, I was 26 years old at the time. Okay, so here we go. This particular discussion deals with only one definite phase of human relationship with the universe, yet it was considered by the ancients of this planet to be of major consequence. This opinion is also deeply shared with intelligences from other worlds. It is because of their concern for us that these higher souls have sought to understand our karmic relativity and aid us in recognizing its functions so that we might be able to better control our future. When I say better control our future, of course, what I mean is control the inner parts of our own workings by understanding it, you know, to be able to, to synergize with it, which helps us to choose what our futures will be in a more coherent, heart-coherent manner. Um, it is known by scientists of the present, now that's present 1975, that cycles of life do exist. The newest discovery by our current academia that these cycles are regulated by stellar occurrences is an age-old knowledge. But this new knowledge is but a surface light in the depths of the darkest ocean. And so we remain a black speck of karmic reaction, not knowing the justice of our torture nor the power of our thoughts. The thoughts of man are the builders of the universe. This is a deep subject involving the penetration of thought frequencies into the ether, the building of thought strengths by repetition of emission, and the final forming of matter through the compounding of thought signals into structural coordination. But thoughts not only create, they control. All the universe is a basic law, a simple angle of comprehension that is balanced through response. Therefore, thoughts respond to one another, and so do their productive energy capsules, such as matter. Our world is relative to our perception, but it is also relative to the project projection of our thoughts and actions into its structure. World tension creates imbalances in the earth. This, in turn, triggers response to release these stress lines in the form of geological and atmospheric realignment. But there is a further release that responds to the Earth's geological imbalance. When tension rises in an abundant amount, the Earth pressures cannot be absorbed by the physical body of this planet alone, but must find their source of outlet in the thinking response. It is as if the body cannot eliminate the negative excess fast enough, and as a result, toxic poisoning infiltrates the whole of the system. This then causes mental imbalance, thus creating and expelling of the negative energies, but also creating a cycle of its own. The expelled excess becomes fodder for more imbalance and is reabsorbed into the earth, sent back into the system, and expelled once again. The only solution is found in the karmic cycle. In order to improve the breakdown of balance, the thought cycle must be rechanneled back into the pos a positive pattern. This can only be accomplished through rectifying the initial action. Souls incarnate out of choice to work off negative aspects of their past sojourns. 
They have brought into this life with them a type of personality, which is in the most part created by their, their karma. Um, you know, I'm going to stop for just a moment here and say, I'm going to inject here, because remember, this was written in 1975. I was 26 years old, and I didn't have the knowledge that I do now in retrospect, the ability to look at what I was, have translated and see underneath the surface of it, you know? So it places here, I'm going to stop and address that. And um, here I'm going to say, you know, the word karma. Thoth does, prefers not to use the word karma just flatly. In other words, oh, that's karma, bad karma, good karma, um, because it's so dimensional. And um, karma is something that we create out of our feeling of lack. So it's not a punishment. It's not even the higher self of the soul saying, oh, you did it wrong. Got to go back and do it again. No, 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 you did it wrong, really wrong this time. Boy, you're going to have to go back and suffer. <laughs> That's not the way it works at all, at all. And so, yes, there is karma, but we just don't understand the true principles of it, so so says. Now, at the time I wrote this, 1975, I hadn't met Thoth yet, in, you know, met him, I hadn't, in, consciously. I was still working solely with the uh, Akashic Record, which now and then was being guided by um, some ultra-terrestrial beings that flew around in little Merkaba ships, and, you know, they weren't Illumin Masters, okay? Not, not that they steered me wrong by any means, but they were, you know, that was not their job to go into the depth. They kept t telling me, even then, soon your mentor will be, you know, in your conscious perception, you'll be able to communicate. But I couldn't then. So I got what I got, you know. And But Thoth, was, when he schooled me, he told me about karma being so much more dimensional and a product of our own choices. We choose to have karma on some level of soul experience. And, and everyone, it's, it's a consensual, huge consensual reality. So um, that's why everyone does it <laughs> on this planet. So you might say, well, okay, if we don't have karma, you know, well, then what's going to happen? I mean, somebody goes out and murders their kids and wife and, you know, because they want the insurance money. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of something really horrible, you know. And... And they die and they come back and all is well. <laughs> no, you know, if we didn't have karma. But see, that's not the case because if a soul is incarnate, they are feeling the presence of the spirit through their incarnation, even if they're doing something really terrible like that, okay? Or if they're Hitler or, you know, we can name some other names, but they're still divine sparks. So if they chose not to punish themselves, there's only one other choice. Only one other choice to forgive themselves. And if they forgive themselves, they become enlightened. Not, you know, overnight, but I mean, that's the step to enlightenment. So, so let's say a soul does, commits a horrible crime. Their inner soul self is always on target with this. The, the higher self always knows. It's like it knows it did wrong. It knows the reason it did it. It knows it's out of balance, terribly out of balance perhaps. It knows all of that. It also knows it's divine. But it went astray. So that soul, when the, when the individual dies, crosses over, whatever, is going to say, oh my God. And they're going to go into deep fear, anguish at being separated from their God self, judgment at being separated from their God self, self-judgment. So when they incarnate back, they've got that karma. What are they going to do with it? Because they created that by judging themselves, you see, and feeling that way. And it can go one way, it can go a lot of ways, karma can. You know, once you've got it on your back, like the monkey on the back. But what if that soul said, oh, yeah, I see it now. I see it, I see it. But you know, I'm a divine being. I'm divine. I'm going to love this out of my existence. I'm going to love this wound away. I'm going to come back and I'm going to be a light for the world. 
You see the difference? Then there wouldn't need to be any karma. Okay, that's enough about that. We'll be here all day. Uh, but I thought that was an important point that I hadn't realized when I wrote this. Um, anyway, about the karma... Um, they have gathered from many storehouses of thought and have built individual channels with which to act. They have therefore created boundaries for themselves, and when the boundaries form, cycles are evolved in which to keep active the thought elevation essential to the continuation of souls. Those of other worlds, as well as our ancestors in the distant past, study these cycles in an attempt to understand the weave of soul character. By tracing the thread, unraveling link by link, the loom of soul consciousness, could be it could be eventually found. What was the true nature of the soul at the beginning? It was the pure form of cosmic ore, that rock which humanity is so firmly rooted in, that rock to which so humanity is so firmly rooted. If this understanding could be reached, then perhaps souls could reprogram their genetic sensors to allow more of the true soul nature to mingle with the karmic personality and in this way lessen the strain of karmic relativity. So you see what's being said here is that genetically, and in the DNA, we have blocked the receptors. We are not allowing a lot of the receptors to unfold to receive the light frequencies of who we are. So that causes, you know, the feeling of separation, ignorance, fear, anxiety, all that stuff. Okay. Um, man is born new unto himself. He is given the gift of innocence. No matter the dreadful lies perpetrated by him as an informer in the French Revolution or the loose affections displayed by him to the women of ancient brothels, he has perhaps be, been a disenchanted poet who wished oblivion by diving into the tumultuous sea, finding instead a greater sea in which his soul could swim, or even a saddened old woman with shattered dreams. Just one moment, I'm going to cough. Sorry about that. Okay, where was the woman with shattered dreams? I was just waxing poetic when I got into the cough. Um, he has perhaps had been a disenchanted poet who wished oblivion by diving into a tumultuous sea, finding instead a greater sea in which his soul could swim, or even a saddened old woman with shattered dreams lacing the shadows of her gloomy life. Yet, when he is born anew, he is a naked piece of life, of response in its most cherishable state. He has not yet awakened to his motivations of a karmic nature that shall drive his incentive and program his brain. The distant guilt, prejudices, and anger will haunt him all too soon. But now he is mindful only of the wisdom of God, the natural flow of knowledge that passes into his tiny brain. But as he develops in physical aptitude, his karmic centers are triggered by the thought patterns of others around him, and he begins the weary trials again. But there is a beautiful objective within the grasp of karma, as well as the more acknowledged tragedy of it. Man can choose his means of utilizing utilization of his karmic channel. He may reach for the letting of blood to sustain him in his guilt for past sins, or he may take that knowledge learned, the sorrow, the regret, and extend it in thought and deed to a fellow traveler. In this way, the cycle of negative excess is broken. He has reaped from the hardships of life and handed another soul the knowledge of his errors. If the whole world were to begin this new positive cycle, soon wars and misery would be greatly reduced, and we would better understand the tragedy that befell us. Well, actually, greatly reduced. We wouldn't have any wars and misery if the whole world did this. Um, if mankind harbored no resentment at the credulities of life, but rather saw them as his own doing, and therefore controllable by him, he would greatly lessen his karma just by that one understanding. <clears throat> I have been writing of the spiritual and mental activities of man in relation to his karma, but the, earth, the karma of man affects the earth also, as I mentioned earlier in this treatise. 
the energy components of the atoms of matter rotate at a cyclic degree in synchronization with thinking, the thinking soul body. The humans of this earth create the transformation of atomic motion into matter consequence, matter consequence by changing their thought patterns in various sequences. For instance, erosion is a great distributor of collective thought. It is a natural and healthy activity of energies. Thought works a great deal through magnetism to distribute matter. It is because of this that humans feel drawn to nature. Our magnetic vibration is attuned to the magnetic pressures asserted and maintained in erosion in the moving of the earth. Mountains are the greatest storehouses of human energy and magnetism. While mountains store large quantities of energies, salt water recycles it. The seas of this planet course in synchronization with stellar pressures and link us to the pulsing of the universal tides. Atmosphere carries our energies like the incandescence of light. It illuminates our senses and stirs us to replenish the earth with positive energies. The soil is composed of recycled matter brought into magnetic action through reprocessing. Like fine wine, reprocessed matter is more potent. The magnetic level of lava, coal, peat, moss, etc. is higher than that of the lesser aged and unrecycled matter. Certain people have affinities with certain places and types of places on this earth. This is often due to past incarnations in such areas, but there is a deeper reasoning behind that fact. People have several incarnations in certain areas because their karmic aptitude is more mobile and active there. By that, the karmic aptitude, you know, it's, for the most part, it means to, to help one out, to, to, to lessen the karmic, you know, magnetism. But in some cases, in some cases, souls are drawn to really negative energy zones because their karma is so profuse, it wants to play that out to the hilt, you know, so there's both sides. <clears throat> this is this is due to the type of matter that the individual soul has helped to create and distribute in the past and present. In other words, th say you just love the desert, you know, you love it, love it, love it, and <clears throat> maybe you've not even lived there, but you still love it, you know, or maybe you've had a chance to, and you, if you had to move, you just hated to move from it because it just felt so good, you know. Well, that's because, essentially, because, the, be the bottom line is because the matter that has been recycled there, the energy that it has, comes from thought processes that are part of your thought processes, soul group, family, so to speak. I don't know if that's the right terminology. Let's just say your thoughts really resonate with the thoughts, and probably some of them were part of it, that created that kind of sterile, desert-like area. Maybe not even the particular one you're living in, but that kind of scene. As an example, suppose a man were to be involved in several lives with complicated karmic dealings, much, uh, much with other souls, so much that those these souls became involved with him uh, to the point of suffocating his action. He would find his attraction to nature to be slim. He would probably prefer security in large cities, where the structure of nature has been drastically altered by physical labor, not mental composition. He would be activating those desires in him to limit karmic action through natural consequence, just as his fellow souls had limited his action in several past experiences. Another man might find his... I don't know why I ever said woman, but another man might find his karmic patterns very even, not dramatic in nature. He may not progress too rapidly, but he does not take chances that might lead to heavier involved karma, even for the sake of working it out. So while he does not digress in large jumps, his progression is almost stagnant. This individual would more likely be inspired by tranquil, even bays of fresh water. Salt water would be too potent for his psychic centers. It make, might make him nervous, irritable, and he would suffer possible allergies from it, as his body would fight all attempts at recycling his energies at such an advanced pace. The land would need to be flat and even, the temperature very cool and even, as hot, hotter weather would ex will expand the psychic centers of the body and stimulate secretion from the pineal gland within the skull, which activates the karmic motion. 
You know, I'm reading this now. I just have to be honest with all of you. I'm reading this and I'm going, how the heck did I know this? I mean, I can kind of understand it now. I've been doing it for so long. There's, and you know, and, but there was no Google, no internet, no books that had anything to do with anything like this. The reason I say that to all of you is because if I, you know, if this isn't something that just I can do, you know, well, yeah, you know, I have my brand of it. I'm doing this in a certain way and it's, it's been going on for a long time. So it's impressive, but you know, we're all doing it. We all have this reservoir of wisdom and knowledge that we can access, that we do access on a daily basis and maybe don't even realize it, that we draw from to keep us stable, sane, and on the right path. And, you know, and you can access it even more deeply. It doesn't have to come out like this, you know, but in your own way. And I just had that really big, you know, burst of knowing and, and, and emotion about it. So I just needed to stop and say that because you have to realize I was a baby then. A baby in a world that had communication that was primitive <laughs> by comparison to today. Okay, let me get back to it now. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I should, probably shouldn't have broken my phasing there. Um, okay, we're talking about the flat and even land and how hot weather stimulates the pineal gland within the skull, which activates the karmic motion, and perhaps there is still another man who finds both peace and exhilaration from the contrast of mountains and valleys sweeping down to the dun distant rumbling ocean. The differences of perception, color spectrum, variance in wind and stillness caused by the mountains and valleys, the whole of the spatial occupancy of matter in such conditions allows great depth in expanding one's senses. A fear of heights might be found in a person whose karmic, spa karmic pace was not expandable to wider dimensions of thought. But the man who is comfortable in an environment of this kind would have the karmic background that allowed for greater mobility of thought, more positive energy, with spurts of negative digression that were not harbored but worked off quickly, no matter what the karmic involvement or misery. A like of great contrast also reveals a depth of great knowledge. A person who likes to imagine such places or go for short trips into the profundity, its profundity, has this knowledge latent, as we all do, some closer to the surface than others. The man who finds harmony of spirit in land like that thrives on seeking to release that knowledge. A seeker of wisdom sits quietly by the ocean. He has found the knowledge. It was not incomprehensible to his ear and to his heart, so now he asks the eternal presence of birth secret questions into the tossing main of ocean and light. The recycling of energies brought about in the sea is a means of reclaiming the wisdom of his soul. It cleans one's mind to reveal a closer image of the true soul. The desert is a sterile trance basking in the sun, wrapped in the heaving arms of, of the sand, wide open to the day. It is simple yet extreme. There are men who are well suited to court the desert. Those who have mastered a serene mind, who welcome simplicity, but secretly challenge it to reveal the complications of mankind. There are many combinations of this give, these given examples, all aligning uh, their desires to the shifting soils of their mother planet. Now, pausing here, you know, was reading about people sitting by the tra flat land, tranquil uh, lakes, you know, but it doesn't mean that you're afraid to move forward if you're there. It could mean something else. These are given as examples. There could be another reason why you're drawn to the lake and the flat land other than you're, you know, stagnant. Uh, so these were just, I was just giving examples in that song because there's so many combinations that can be worked with here. These are kind of basic ones. The time for creating is passed into the twilight. We must now begin the restoration of what we of that which we once created. Well, you know, I could argue with my own sentence there because we're always creating. So I don't know if that was really the correct way to put it, but what I think I was trying to say was that we can't keep creating broken structures or half-light images. We have to go for the full light. And so we have to recon we have to bring back the first moments of that creational story that were beautiful and light engendered. 
and see where they started tearing. And that's where we, you know, bring it forward. You bring it into the heart center and then create a new from that. And I think that's really what I was trying to say there. <clears throat> I'm going to pause just a moment for another sip of water. If a building displeases us, we tear it down and build a new one. When our bodies become inadequate through the strain imposed on them because of our disarrayed logic, we create death to relieve us of our predicament, then find a new life in memory less painful to endure. But this is the great error of our ways. Restoration is the single key to what God has given us. The original breath of thought, the divine seed, we, we didn't... Uh, the divine seed we did not create. We merely mirrored it into our daydreams. We are living in the land of Nod, touching but not being touched, loving, hating, philosophizing and moralizing. But if it falls back upon us, for like in most dreams, the actions within are false, but it falls back upon us. There are accumulations of our fears acted out by remote control, not involving our true nature, but fantasizing through our longing to be real, to be part of the total reality of God and the universe. Despite all our frightened efforts against it, the soul reveals itself in the nature of this mystical and ruggedly beautiful planet that is so enchanting. Those greater thinking minds of other worlds are awed by this earth's manifestation. We overcome ourselves to express beauty, and this is a great lesson to be learned by all worlds. Because of this, we are very special to those beings of wisdom from many planes of awareness who see us as a basic step for the soul's continuation. Among the planets aware of us and involved in aiding us where karma allows, there is a positive action of the soul representing, represented by each planet. Earth is given the title of hope. Such as a quality could not be issued in vain. It will be realized in our tomorrows through our behavior toward our brothers and sisters and recognized in the beauty of this earth, clothed, clothed in the garments of humanity's hope. And so that, my friends, is the end of that one. Um, but let's look at it a little more. When I read it now, and I have not read this since I probably around the time I wrote it, or I might have read it when I put it into the 1982 issue, you know, but it's been a long time. So that's why I was saying, whoa, you know, I was, I was going into my own self going, how did I write this then? But... Um, <clears throat> This was around the time, no, I guess it was a little later, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it was a little, it was about five years after uh, I presented Captain, then Captain Andrew Mitchell with my science work, but a lot of the science was like this, it was this type of thing, and that was out of Universe One, which I ought to read it to you out of sometime, because that was written in 1970, I think. Anyway, okay, let's, there's a lot here, and I would really, really like to hear from you guys on this. And not as teacher wants to hear from the pupils, by any means. I want to hear some wisdom coming out from you guys that helps me uh, a little more understand what I just wrote. <laughs> I mean, we're all in this together. Realize that we're all in this together, and all of you have wisdom that can benefit us, us all. So look at it from that perspective. And what are you, you know, well, yes, so so would we all. And that's what my Nessia library group is working on, Paige, is to get all this stuff and get it together. And that isn't even an electronic format, except for that little blurb that I copied out sometimes. Um, so, you know, they're working on getting this together and then we'll have it all and be well organized to go, you can see where, you know, want to go and what thing you want to look at. And there it is. At least that's what we're hoping for. And God bless them. And, and Drew, and Drew is part of that because she has just about everything I've ever written. I don't think you have translations of the golden rod though. That was a long time ago. Do you have that one, Drew? Um, no, I don't have that, but I... You that come out, but you put that in a, in what nineteen in one of the nineteen eighty two sources because yeah. I remember reading that, but it's been a long time yeah, since yeah. I read it. That, but that, no, I don't have the original. That book. came out in nineteen eighty two, and also okay. 
uh, in this issue that I was just publishing here. I can't read what that is. Anyway, it's at least in 1982. Um, so anyway, there, you know, these ladies, uh, there's, there's, there's Drew who's been helping out because she has all these issues, and there's Valerie and um, uh, Kailasa, and Kailasa was one that started it up, and, um, and Kathleen Miller. Um, and Valerie has her avatar body now. I, I put it together for her. She's going to hopefully be joining us. You know, she's kind of busy right now with a lot of things, including this. So they're just all working on this because, you know, guys, I really can't do much of anything. I, you know, I, I get up and walk around a little bit and it, it hurts. So um, I can't get into my boxes. You know, I can't mail stuff out. I can't do anything. So um, they're, they're doing it for me, and I really, really appreciate it. I never even imagined that they'd get so excited about it. Let's see, Muse says, I think it is important to unravel our negative karma in order to find happiness in this life, yet how do you do that remains a mystery to me. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you. It, I, I have, we all have the same situation. It's like we're, we're aware enough, those of us sitting here, that we know what we want to do. We understand a lot of the universal principles involved. And we're learning about more every day. And yet we still sit here and go, well, what's wrong with this picture, you know? So I wish I had an answer for you because I'm in the same mess or I'd be able to get up and kick my heels and run around the yard a few times, you know? And I'm not doing that. So obviously I'm still working with it as well. But from the Thothic perspective, and that's the only... I, I wish I could talk from personal experience at this point, but from the Thothic perspective... We make it complicated through our fear, our feeling of separation, and uh, our our wounds, our pain, whether it's you know inner pain, emotional pain. Uh, so, you know that's the depth of it, and the the ways to work with it are so individual. Some people use meditation. Some of the people that doesn't work for. Uh, you know, some people use symbols and images some you know some don't music tones i think working with pure sounds like tibetan bells and bowls and uh really well-tuned tuning forks and um uh, things of that nature even your own voice your own voice is very important no matter what you think you sound like you know chanting oohs and ahs if you don't know any fancy chant words but you know hey there's some beautiful chants out there uh some of the um, Hindu chants and, and all of that. I mean, you don't have to be a Hindu. They, they, those chants come out of the, uh, the Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit comes from the original Alawi language of Lemuria. So, you know, those chants are really productive. Um, but make up your own, you know, whatever works for you. And it's important to have a protocol. You don't have to have it in cement. You, you can change it. It can be flexible. But do something, you know. And, and, and continue it. Thoth told me one time it's better to do something consecutively, persistently, every day than to do, you know, and, and you do it like three minutes. I'm not suggesting that's as long, you know, you should, probably should do it longer, but even if you did it three minutes a day, every single day, and more or less around the same time, than doing, you know, an hour a week. Yeah, I know, Muse um, Page, Muse Page. <laughs> I think that uh, that's a, something that happens for me as well. And um, Yes, Drew? Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, Remember when a long time ago we were doing the QSS, what was that, the quantum um, starlight streaming? Oh, yes. Am I saying that? I, yes, I remember. remember uh -huh. I, I never, I always just say QSS on that, but you know, that that was meant to um, kind of set you, uh, 
I don't know, not at the zero point, maybe at the zero point. I'm not even sure, but it kind of puts you back in line uh -huh. with the cosmos. And I have found lately by um, just saying that, I say it three times, uh -huh. once a day, and it seems to, it's like all of a sudden, no matter what has happened before, what's been said, or if I feel something has happened that wasn't right or whatever, you know, if I'm, but if I say that, I seem to be able to just, I, I pick myself up and I, and I go on. It's like, it's, it's all done, wow. it's set, and uh, now it's time to move well, forward, you I know. I need to go back to that, and I, I'm not going to do it at the moment since we're taping this and take me time, but, um. And find that, and maybe we'll do a session on it next time, you know, a gathering on it. Uh, yeah, Bring I it think back. that would be really good. You did look. a video or an MP3 or something on it, I remember, yeah. a long time ago. Well, I could do something yeah. now. I could bring it back and put it, maybe yeah. update it, you know, and, and do something with it. That would be very cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's I remember, it's QSS return to zero point now. It was zero point. Yeah. So QSS return to zero point now. And you just, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and it's like it kind of sets your system and you move forward, you know. Yes, the, the principle of it was, uh, and this was given to me about, oh gosh, how long ago was that? Drew, about four or five years ago, maybe longer, five years ago. Um, what is to set your reset your clock, reset your emotional and not just emotional, your your cellular energy body clock, so that all the emotional stuff that's just caking in there, you know, going along each day needs to be cleaned out. So you do a reset, and uh, but there's a whole you know this material you need to kind of read to understand it better, and then you can use that reset now. But you know, try it just even without the information. Just say re reset now and bring it back to zero point, especially if you're feeling tense or a lot of emotions coming up or even just things not going your way, you know, whatever, um, you know, give it a try. And I'm, I'm going to look that up and maybe we'll do that next uh, next gathering, work with that. That's, thank you, Drew. See, gosh, you brought something back to my attention that uh, I really needed to know about because I should be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. Here, here okay. I am That's sitting great. around saying, I can't get out of my chair. And I've got all this stuff that, that I've done. And it's like, you know, okay, hello, I know. Maya. Get with the picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sometimes we forget. It, things overwhelm us, you know. Okay. That was very productive. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Or questions or anything? How to counteract what, Paige? I mean, yeah, hey, Muse. I'm sorry, you want to go by Muse now? I will call you Muse. <laughs> Other people's negative vibes. Um... Yeah, uh, forgiving them and forgiving yourself. You know, the honoponopono. Uh, I, I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you, you know. Uh, because as you forgive yourself, then everything else is erased. All the other. Because it's all coming from you. Um, I have a question about, you were saying something about the, the land um, in your karma or whatever you want to call it. Oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, um, so are you saying like when, when we come here, we incarnate in a certain part of um, the world or whatever because that's where we either have been and need to, to fix it or... It's a good place for us to fix it. I, I wasn't okay. real clear yeah. on that, let, I guess. Let me go over that a bit. That's good. Okay. Uh, when, we, when we incarnate, the, the locations we, you know, where we're born, that's a big one, uh, but also where we choose to move and travel to, even if we think we don't want to go there, but the job is sending us, you know, or something like that. All of these places are part of karmic tracking. It's um, bringing up to us either things we need to clear or we've cleared them and now we need, we're going to a place that allows us to, you know, help us move to the next step. 
that sort of thing. So that's a level of it. But see, that's the top level. What, what organizes that energy? That comes from the land itself and the fact that this very soil is made up of thoughts, of, of emotions, of energy that we have recycled, all of us on the planet. And if the recycled energy of certain places and the topography uh, really, uh, re you know, aligns to the kind of recycled energy that's there, um, draws you, it's drawing you for a reason. So even if you've incarnated there before, why did you incarnate there before? You know, you can trace it back, and when you trace it far enough back, you get to the fact that thoughts have created these, the Earth, and uh, or have organized it, or you know, worked with it, and so you're drawn to the soils, the rocks, the trees, the mountains, the topography that best suits the the, the thought energy that you're carrying still in you that's impacting you either for positive or for not so positive so it's it's a, a deep study it's not simple it's not saying oh well it's because you know i need to do this or i did no it's it's deeper than that but that gives you an understanding of how to work with it and say well it could be you know when i okay let's say you don't live in a place but you'd really like to well let's take you drew for instance you know, you're enjoying, you think St. Simon's really nice and you really like it there, but your heart is in Colorado, right? You really, really love, you'd love to be back in Colorado where you lived before, where you were born. And um, so you might look at that. Well, uh, you like St. Simon's Island in Georgia, so what about that? You know, what's the energy, the topography? What does it say about moving emotions, about moving thoughts and energies? What does Colorado say, where you were from, about moving thoughts and energies? Uh, emotional body, the effect on the emotional body. You could look at both of those and say, well, neither one of them is negative for you, obviously. But, you know, what's the difference? And why am I here and I can't get back to there? What do I need to be doing here? What does this energy tell me? And what can I draw upon from my birth note? You know, so you could look at, you, we could do a whole, you know, I could start up a practice. <laughs> Charge people money for, for <laughs> doing their, their um, you know, whatevers, you know. And, and, but that's, uh, it, it, that's I would have good. to learn it first. I would have to go to, yeah. to school with both and, because it's not that easy, you know. It's a little complicated than that, like learning astrology or you know something of that mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very very interesting. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do that. I'm gonna work on those two things. And I was also thinking when you were mentioning this um, uh, about remember um, now I wasn't there at the time you did this. I think I was I don't know where I was, but you did a. Um, talked about the memory seeding in the uh, sand dunes. Remember in Colorado yeah. you had that uh, memory memory seeding thing and it was because that that was a place that something had happened there to cause uh, something from Atlantis yeah. or something. Something absolutely. blew up there or something. I can't right, remember. Right, right. So, <coughs> that's absolutely correct. You put the two together. I would never have thought of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a okay. it was a okay. it was a clearing out on a planetary level of some energies mm -hmm. that had gotten sort of stuck there and needed to be cleared out because that is a, a high uh, Taya zone T A Y A both calls those are areas mm -hmm. of the Earth that are the light codes of those areas are going to be ascending with us <laughs> you know not all yeah. of the Earth is going to send send its light codes with us but those areas are so it was needing to be okay. cleaned out a little bit and that's the work we were doing then we had a huge group of people I say we my former husband Simeon and I um, and that was when we both were newly moved to that area and um, I don't know we had about 26 27 people working on it with us and the neatest wow. thing happened to just just a little story here because it's so cool um Okay, we get out to the sand dunes to do this, right? And we actually have a video of it. I wonder where that is. I have to ask Simeon. He might have it on his hard drive still. It's just a little blur, but somebody took, a, took it, and we put, I've forgotten. It was so long ago, we couldn't put it up on YouTube. There wasn't a YouTube, so, um, but he might still have it on his hard drive. Anyway, the, the scene was we're all, you know, tromping out into the the great sand dunes of Colorado, okay, it's a beautiful sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, 
anywhere. And you can see on the Colorado Plateau, see it's flat across until you get to the mountains and then they go up, you know. So if you're standing up sort of like we were on the sand dunes, you can look way across the huge valley and you can see there's no clouds, nowhere, not, not at all. So we get there, we have to cart our, our um, water coolers and our mats to lie on in the sand and our cameras and you know everything everybody's got stuff right and we're bringing it on up there we look like the most motley uh caravan you've ever seen with people with you know their sunscreens all over their face <laughs> it was it was really comical you know we're all loping along stumbling in the sand like we're you know like we're lost in the desert <laughs> <laughs> like a, the foreign legion with little napkins over our heads to keep the sunburn off. So anyway, we get there, right? And we we spread all our stuff out. And you can see this in the video. We put all our stuff up. We get it all ready. And we, we're there doing our thing. Now it cuts because the video has been edited. To We're getting into the moment. We've gone through a huge process, the whole thing, up to this point, okay? And the point that we're at, is where we actually do the release energy thing. And it's a it's something that isn't subtle. It works fast. It's like boom, you know, and it happens. Okay? When we say the words, and I don't remember, I think I did, I was reading from this thing, and I, you know, I said it, and everyone was tuning into it, and it was said instantly, instantly, huge clouds starting come over the mountains, just like a fast moving motion picture thing. And the wind starts blowing sideways. All of our stuff goes up in the air, you know, and the coolers are even blown over. People are getting they had the sunscreen on them. So now the sand is sticking to the sunscreen and we become these little sand bodies. And people are, you know, it's it's hysterical, but it's so dramatic. And so I'm trying to hold on to my paper. And Simeon's trying to hold on to me because I didn't weigh very much in those days. <laughs> and, and I'm reading the rest of it because, you know, it goes on. And when it's when I finish it, the last words, which is about like five minutes later, because this wind's still going, rain start not rain. I don't think there was any rain. It was just this huge wind and the black clouds, you know. And And I finish reading it. The minute I take a breath after finish reading it, the wind stops. The clouds start breaking up, moving away, and in five more minutes, it's sunshine again. So, you know, that kind of thing just, you can't tell me that that was a coincidence. And I've had other dramatic things happen, too, with these kind of things, but that was the most. That was really, like, the most. <laughs> really? M Maya? <laughs> I'm not surprised. I mean, when we do that kind of activational work, you know, these things happen. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> oh well well that was a fun journey down memory lane okay before we end here I would like to ask you all this um, if we could just go around the circle and say where what kind of area on the planet are you most drawn to? Now, I don't mean for vacationing. We'd all like to vacation in most of these beautiful, any place that's scenic. We'd love to vacation there. You know, but after a while, haven't you been at a really beautiful place for vacation and you like it? But you're anxious, you know, after a few days or maybe a week, you're anxious to get home. You know, that's not really where you want to live. Other places, it's like, I never want to leave here. So I'm asking you, where on the planet do you feel drawn to that you'd like to really live, or you think so at this moment anyway? Let's let's hear it from you. Uh, you can voice or you can text. And let's let's just go around the circle here. Let's start with Maya because her hands are waving, so I know she's typing something. <laughs> Where would you like to be? Oh, I'm in I'm in uh, Kauai, and I I like it here. It's beautiful. I love it here for many reasons. There's some down reasons too. You know that uh, no place is perfect, but I really like it. But I also love Colorado, the two places. Yeah, I'm on Kauai. I've been to, I've lived on Maui very briefly, and I've been to the Big Island. So my two are Hawaii and Colorado. So what's yours, Maya? Oh, yours is Maui. It, would you like to live there, actually, Maya?
any island there. Cool. Okay, so you're you're a tropical girl. And I know Drew is Colorado, but I don't want to speak for you, even though I just did. Is that the case, Drew? <laughs> um, Colorado, and uh, also um, today and, and have for years actually been drawn uh, to like New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, the the desert. I, I oh, would live okay. there. I, so you got either one of those. And mountains. That's a, now that's an interesting yeah. clue that you can work with. Yeah. You know, guys, think about these things, especially if you have two different places that are very contrasting like Drew does. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I gave mine. So let's see what we got here. Who's next? Rex. Where are the two places? Maybe it's where you are already. Where the, Or one place. Where are the places that you're most drawn to that you feel you'd really like to live? Even if it's just one, that's fine. Well, I would really like to live on the west coast of Sligo in Ireland, uh, where I went <clears throat> last summer. Uh, I'm seriously considering going there. The only thing that's sort of uh, putting me off really is um, uh, we've got this vote on the European community so uh, you know it would be a disaster if I moved there and then we decided to vote out of it then I wouldn't be able to stay there but oh, it, yeah. <clears throat> it's beautiful there. Uh, just um, I just love the landscape there and uh, the sea and uh, <clears throat> the, the small the islands that are around there and the history, uh, <clears throat> and the rent is very cheap as well. Ah, now I didn't get the name of it, Rex. Could you say it again? Because I, I, the sound wasn't too good at that moment. Um, it's <clears throat> it's an area called Ballinfall, just near Sligo in Ireland. Oh, in Ireland. Okay. Oh yes, Ireland's beautiful, beautiful. I've never been there, but it is beautiful. All righty, Birdie. Where would you? Where's the place you are really drawn to to live? Even if it's where you already are, you know where. Where is the place that really calls your soul? Um, uh, Spain. Spain. Ah. Yes. Any particular? Yeah, I have some past life memories. Uh huh. From Spain. Um, but when I first decided I wanted to go and live in Spain, I didn't remember those uh -huh. memories. I've never been there. Yeah. I've never been any anywhere for than maybe six or seven hours away from my home here where I am now. Uh-huh. And I love it here, but it doesn't feel like home. And and you're in Vancouver, right? No, I'm I'm near Toronto. Oh Toronto, I'm sorry. I I thought yeah, yeah. Canada's a big place. <laughs> okay. It is a big place, yes. Okay. Um, so let's see where we are now. To Paige, to Muse. Yeah, you're near Toronto. So Bali, Maui, BVI. What's BVI? Ontar Ontario, Muscoga Highlands. Oh, BVI, is that in Ontario, Muscoga Highlands? Is that British Virgin British Virgin Islands? Okay, sorry, I didn't know what that was. Boy, you've got several places that really call to you. Now, see, that's interesting. You know, something to take into consideration. Okay, think of the, t you know, you can just muse on it a while and think of the landscape and the the energies it represents and what it makes you feel like and you know and uh, see how that addresses possibly. Uh, your energies and how you can work with those energies whether you ever go to those places or not. Ah, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Well, Maui is very, I mean, uh, Kauai is very cost prohibitive. But, you know, God is taking care of me here. If I may use the old term for our divine host. <laughs> Um, okay, now let's see, who do we have here? I can't see the name. Oh, we're back to Maya. We have such a small group today. Yes. So, you know, these are things you can begin to work with with these and just see if, uh, where it takes you, feeling them out and uh, uh, what does it say about who you are, you know, in a non-judgmental way, just looking at your soul spirit, free spirit being.
Well, everyone, we're coming up to the hour, but if anyone else has a last minute thing they'd like to express, um, please do so. Otherwise, um, what's, your brother lives in Collingwood. Yeah. Otherwise, we will conclude for the day. Oh, that's cool. You guys near, live near each other. Or your brother does. <laughs> mm -hmm. But isn't it absolutely a miracle that we can be together here like this? I mean, you know, I've gotten kind of nostalgic this morning because, um, you know, reading this that I wrote so many years ago and talking to you all about these things, it's like, wow. Thinking about not having internet or email or Facebook or YouTube. I don't know if any of you are, well, Drew would be along with me on that. <laughs> but, you know, that's a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think about it too, Maya, like when, uh, when I lived in the tent, for heaven's sakes, up in the mountains of Colorado. Mm. I mean, no phone, no phone. No internet, no TV, no nothing. You know, we had a little ra uh, battery-powered radio, and you could get one station. You know, <laughs> that, would drive, that would drive me crazy really fast. <laughs> and so there, there, you know, there, there wasn't any uh, connection except the people you got to see once in a while, you know. So you, you, you went drove sixty miles to town and talked everybody's leg off, you know, or yeah. whatever. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Bye, Rex. Take Goodbye. care. Goodbye, Good night. Rex. Good night. Well, you know, I remember the first time. That, uh, that Simeon and I saw the internet. We were at a friend's house. We had a computer now, you know, to do you know, just an old clunky computer to, you know, do stuff on. But uh, we first saw the internet and they pushed buttons and up came screens, you know, and windows, old fashioned windows. And there we were on a PC internet and it took forever to get from one page to the next. And we, well, we were sitting there, yeah. both of us going, oh, well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just in 1994 or something, 92, 93, 94, something. Yeah, I know. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, yeah, anyway. people used to write letters. Yeah, that's true. That we it. used to write letters and make phone calls. I mean, you know, and that's what I was saying. And I was so glad to go to the post office in this in in Rifle. You know, like I said, it was 60 miles away, and I was yeah. so excited when I had a letter in the post office box. You know, just. Um, just amazing things it is, since, it is. since then. Oh, okay. I'm going to uh, turn our video off here. <laughs>